I just want to talk a little bit more about getting in the back door for employment. One thing I learned very early after I uh, got out to um, Arizona to work on my master's degree is if you meet the right person, they can let you in the back door. And at lunch, we had a whole lot of discussions about you know, problems with applying for jobs online and all of that. You know, short circuit that. Because you find the right person at the back door, that's the person that's on the other side of that computer anyway. And it's sort of like, you know, Dorothy's got the ruby slippers, but you don't see them. You know, if you want a tech job, when I lived in Arizona, uh, there was a big Motorola plant. You know, they made all, all kinds of electronic stuff. Well, if you saw somebody in the supermarket that had a Motorola ID badge hanging around his neck, maybe you might want to show him your portfolio. That's the kind of stuff I did. And, and when I was writing for the Fire and Ranchman magazine, I'd go to the cattle feeders meeting, and that's where I sold the jobs. I used to call it card hunting. You know, the press pass got me into the conventions for free, and um, I sold jobs on the trade show floor at McCormick Place in Chicago. I could have been kicked out for that. But I was really, really discreet in how I did it. Um, you know, when I forgot to tell you, about how I got into the Swift plant. I, uh, the lady that liked my shirt so much, she was the wife of the insurance agent, of all things. The movie changed it to the wife of the plant manager, but it really was the wife of the, wife of the insurance agent. And I met her at a Arizona cattle feeders cocktail party. That's where I met her. And I kind of learned card, cocktail parties and those receptions, those were just places to sell jobs. And the thing that was very interesting about the Emmy parties, I went to you know, be on the award show thing, go to the parties afterward, they weren't drunken bashes. They were networking. Nobody was getting drunk. They were too busy looking for the next job. They were doing, everybody in that Emmy's party was doing what I was doing, because you know in movies everybody's freelance. And I started out my sort of work stuff one little job at a time. I painted signs at the Arizona State Fair for the carnival. How did I get to do that? Well, I was walking around the carnival and I saw this old sign painter guy and I told him that I painted signs and I showed him my portfolio. Next thing I was painting, oh, stupid freak show exhibit things, really dumb things like the Himalayan ice monster, um, uh, really dumb stuff. But it's getting jobs. And my cattle business started out kind of the same way, one little small project at a time. You get one rancher that's satisfied, then you go on and do another one. And this is something I kind of figured out really early. And I wasn't shy. You know, my mother had me um, serving hors d'oeuvres at her dinner parties. That taught me not to be shy. Also, Let's talk about how I transitioned into the world of work. I did discuss this morning about all the things I did in high school. And I was one of the students that had to be taken out of a normal high school because I was bullied and teased, and I went to a specialist school. And while I was at the specialist school, I worked. I took care of the horse barn, I milked dairy cows, I shingled the barn roof, and I did very little studying. And I was learning some important skills. Then how did I get into college, since I hadn't done one lick of studying in high school? Uh, my mother talked to the dean of a new small college that had just opened next door to my specialist school. And Dr. Coles decided to let me in on probation. By this time, I decided to turn it around and I was going to study. And I did study. Had a lot of trouble in math. And Mr. Dion, the brand new, right out of school math teacher, tutored me in math. You know, and I just asked him. I had to find my own accommodations, and I had to find a French tutor because that was just hopeless. Um, but then, when I was at Franklin Pierce, I was still visiting the ranch in the summertime. But then my mother got to thinking, well, you know, we got to do some other things. So she set up an internship at a program that worked with autistic and other kids in the summer, and I was a counselor, like a camp counselor. And when I did that job, I had to rent a room in a house. That was a real new experience for me. And my original plan was to live on the campus of the, of the, where the hospital was, but that wasn't going to work. I had to, uh, they, that got under construction. So I had to rent a room, and that worked out all right. And then another summer, I worked at a research lab, and I had to rent a house with another lady. These were very good experiences in my transition. 
And one of the problems that I'm seeing, and we were just talking, the previous speaker was just talking about outcomes, I'm seeing a lot of really smart Asperger guys graduating from college and not getting work because they aren't working on work things while they're still in college. Yes, painting signs for freak shows, kind of a stupid thing, but boy, let me tell you, it taught me work skills. I had to paint a sign that they wanted. I did the ticket booth for the Wax Museum, Country Western Wax Museum. That was one of the things I painted. Um, Jimbo the Giant Steer. Um, just all kinds of silly things. And I, I really liked doing that kind of stuff. Now, we have a whole lot of discussions going on at home about specialist versus mainstream schools. That's going on all the time. And what I've been kind of seeing, and it goes along with what was just said here, a lot of these kids that are quirky and different, they have an easier time in el what we call elementary school, primary school grades, than in high school. And I was one of the kids that had to be taken out because I was teased to death. Let me tell you, I was still teased to death in the, in the specialist school. I did not get away from teasing there. But also I'm finding that sometimes a kid does just fine in the local high school. What I have found on the whole school thing, and I can't imagine it being that different here, so much depends upon the local situation. In one local situation, the local school is awful. In another local situation, it's wonderful. Then you get teachers and parents that hate each other's guts. That doesn't work. <laughs> uh, you know, I get, we have a lot of private specialist schools too. You know, we'll get into public versus private discussion. And I'm finding that that doesn't really matter. It's the local particular situation. So my kind of viewpoint on mainstreaming is, Elementary school or primary school, I'm much more pushing for mainstreaming. But in high school, there's a lot of kids that need to be taken out of a regular high school. There's a lot of kids where they need to just come out of a high school, finish up online. There's all kinds of stuff online to finish up school and test out, at least in the US there is. And while they're doing that, start training them for work. Because we've got to start getting a whole lot more outcome based. You know, when I was in graduate school, I realized that I had to make a slow transition from the world of school to the world of work. And if I didn't do that, I'd really be in trouble. And I'm a big believer in the gradual transition. If I had just graduated from, from a, a master's, boom, and never worked, that would have been a real mess. Then I was out doing stuff out in the cattle industry, freelance design projects. Those dip fats shown in the movies were some of those projects. And then in 1980, the economy just went tanked in the US, and I went back to get my PhD. But while I was working my PhD, I was still working and doing consulting. And if I got a chance to do a cattle speaking engagement, I did it. Oh, I realized that was free advertising. And the other thing I had to have help on, I had a good contractor friend that built that dip fat job. He helped me set up my freelance corporation. That's something where if you're gonna go the freelance route, or I was just talking to the young man who had the poster today wanting to open up a computer shop. Somebody's got to help him with the business stuff. You know, like you've got to become incorporated and, and there's all, all kinds of reasons for doing that. Tax advantages, all kinds of stuff. And, uh, and, you got, and it can be set up in a really simple way that you can do it. And fortunately, I had people that seeked me out. I was really weird, but there was this really good contractor that seeked me out because he wanted me to design jobs for him. You see, this is where the portfolio and selling the work really works. But you've got to put the right stuff in the portfolio. Because back when I was, uh, you know, just starting out, I tried to sell a military base that was near where my aunt's ranch was, Fort Huachuca, some signs. And I made the mistake of showing them the uh, signs I made for my aunt's uh, primary school classroom. That did not impress the military soldier guy. Um, I should have just shown them the implement dealer signs and the feed yard sign that I made. You've got to put the right stuff in the portfolio for the right client. And it's got to be presented neatly. People tend to put too much stuff in it. You want something that when they open it up, they go, wow, 30 seconds. And sometimes the old fashioned mail's the best way to send it because people don't open strange attachments. They're too worried about getting viruses. And then the other thing is have it on your phone because you never know where that person's gonna be. And make sure it's actually downloaded onto the phone because you might not always have a signal, you might not be able to get on the web, don't just count on getting on the web. But I wanna try to get you to see the door, see the opportunities. 
And I didn't build up my business overnight. It happened one little project at a time. So I want to make another few other comments about the specialist school I went to. When I first went there, it had 25 students in it, and it was marvelous, and it was a boarding school. Then they were hired up for money, and they started taking juvenile delinquents from the state of Massachusetts. That was a mess. You know, sometimes these things get too big, and something that works really well small works really terrible and it's too big. I've visited a number of specialist schools in the, in the U.S. Some are real good, some are not. You know, it's like a lot of different things. And what you call the head teacher here, that person sets the tone for the place. It's just like meatpacking plants. You know, you're going to have animal, good animal welfare at a meatpacking plant, it's up to the plant manager to enforce that. You know, the top sets the tone. It's just that simple. Okay, now for the photorealistic visual thinkers like me, um, industrial design. Now what I do with the livestock basically is industrial design. What do industrial designers do? Okay, let's take a product like an iPhone or maybe an iPad. Steve Jobs was an industrial designer, he wasn't an engineer. You go look up his patents on Google. You can go on Google and just type in Steve Jobs patents and look at his patents. A crystal staircase for a store, that's one of his patents. The, the, the layout of the of the iPhone screen is one of his patents. Um, and he did try to patent rounded corners on a phone. I don't think that one got through the patent office. Uh, but it was the user experience. That's what the industrial designer does. Then the engineer, the mathematician mind, has got to make the innards. Someone's got to make the insides of the phone work. It's, uh, you know, it takes both the mathematician mind and the art mind to make many, many different kinds of products. So like an architect would design this auditorium, but then you've got to have engineers to make all the mechanical stuff in this building work. That's where the different kinds of minds work together. Um, computer network specialists, that's, um, that does a lot of stuff with hardware, graphic arts, drafting, uh, auto mechanics, diesel mechanics. You can visualize uh, how things can go wrong in the car, fixing computers. You know, that's another business. It's very easy to just start out one customer at a time and you get some satisfied customers, you gradually grow. Um, I was just watching on the BBC this morning, they were setting up a stage for some big concert. Well, you gotta have people to do that. People like me would be good at that. Training animals, photographer. Photographer's a great field. You start out, you know, it's building up your business. Uh, architects, and then we have a, a, a Veterinarian, actually, in, in your country, is an easier degree to get here than it is at home. Um, so we have another program called Veterinary Technician, which is a two-year degree. It's basically a veterinary nurse. It's easier to do than getting into vet school. Uh, you know, for some people, they just get into regular jobs the way to go. For others, the freelance route. Really got to look at the freelance route, because that's how a lot of people can be successful. And since I work in a uh, in the construction industry, I know a lot of people that do freelance welding, freelance metal work, and they're on the spectrum. Oh, well, one of these guys, one time, a plant manager really abused him, and he called me up, and he's all upset. And I said, "Well, the guy's just a jerk. You're going to have to just take your equipment out of there and send him a bill and walk away from him, and you make sure you send him a bill, and then work with your good clients." And and one of the things is oftentimes a problem in a freelance business is collecting money. Well, I had a very simple fee structure. All my fees were round figures. I charged somebody uh, like $100 for an hour's worth of work. It was like either $1,000 or $2,000 for something I did for a day. In other words, the fee was always a round figure. So when I billed them and I got the check back from the client, it might be $2,345. Well, then I would know the $345 was the expenses. See, I just kept my fees really, really super simple. You know, and you don't charge every phone call. You don't nickel and dime clients. You know, but it, basically I had an hourly rate. I had a day rate if I drove out in a car and I could come back in a day. And I had, if the airplane was touched, if I got on an airplane, then the fee was doubled. It didn't matter if the flight was 10 minutes or four hours. You know, it all kind of works out have to keep it really, really simple. And, you need, and, the, and, and then I was able to keep the records and do that. Taxes, um, you're probably going to need some professional help on that. I have a little book called Developing Talents, which gets into a lot more on some of the uh, 
you know, how to get businesses started. And, but you've got to just do it. And, and fortunately, people recognized my ability. And, I had, and my contractor friend, he says, you know, you've got to get incorporated. I'm going to show you how to do it. And he took me to his lawyer that he used for his corporation. And we went in and we set up my little corporation. I'm not sure how the rules work over here, but I'm sure you've got similar things where you've got to set up a business. Uh, you have to, you know, file with the Corporation Commission every year, and, and you know, you look at stuff and go, ah, how can I possibly do this? Well, if you do really good work, there'll be people that will come out of the woodwork and help you on things like that. All right, let's look at the jobs for the mathematician minds. Well, math teacher, when I was in college, I had a math teacher, I'm sure he was on the spectrum. You know what he collected? The phone books. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Phone books. I collect convention badges, but I wouldn't collect phone books. And, and uh, he was on one of the math teachers. How about a scientist? How about people that work on electronic equipment? Uh, there are several companies that have been formed of people with Asperger's that do testing of programming. Programmers, half of Silicon Valley's got Asperger's. And there's all kinds of free programming classes online, like that Udacity, that Code Academy. And, and you actually can get grades on these things. And you know what, there's job recruiters on the other end of that thing looking at all the grades and stuff. You know, they're not doing it for charity, giving this stuff away free. You might find the back door right there through one of those things. You know, go type of free classes online. I, into, in, into Google. You've got Google right there. There's so much good stuff and there's so much rubbish in there, but there's also so much good stuff, especially on computers, math, uh, those kind of areas. Uh, wonderful stuff online that can be, you know, check it out, and it's all free. That's the thing that's nice. It's free. Engineers, my grandfather was an engineer who uh, was a co-inventor of the automatic pilot for airplanes. Physicists, they're probably all on the spectrum. Simon Baron Cohen works with a lot of those. Musicians, statisticians, chemists. You know, we've got to find the job that fits the person's mind. How about the verbal thinkers? I'm finding this group's having the hardest time with employment because it's harder to have a fancy portfolio to show off. I had a gorgeous portfolio. My drawings, I'd whip out one of the big drawings. And then I had plastic pages with pictures, you know, that I could show people, and, and that's how I sold jobs. And then when I sent out a packet, I'd send like two cattle magazine articles, some pictures done on the color printer, and a fold-out drawing. You know, now I'm, I would just show it to them on a phone. It's kind of small, but then they could, then they would, after I talked to them, then they would go on my website and they could look at it. Math programming people can put programming on their phone, show it off, and you can say, well, I did this kind of code, and it only used this much memory, and it did this wonderful thing, using all the technical words. But the word guys, unfortunately, they sometimes tend to get very extreme views on things. Like work, let's just leave sex, politics, and religion at home. Okay, I was just talking to somebody that was involved with the museum here that had a cardboard cutout of Margaret Thatcher and the security guard saw people punching it on the security cameras. You know, let's just um, leave that stuff at home. That's, those, those subjects just are not welcome at work. You know, safe things to talk about at work, gardens, pets, the weather, favorite movies as long as they don't get involved with the controversial subjects. You don't need to tell them all about yourself. And this brings up another thing is how much do you disclose? I don't think sometimes people disclose too much. You know, to this day, I don't disclose. If I'm on an airplane, I don't tell anybody about the movie. I just tell my college professor, I teach animal science at Colorado State University and uh, design things for meat plants. That's what I tell people. And, you know, sometimes with accommodations, you can get in there and say, well, the law says I should have this or have that. Well, that's what ticks off employers. When I worked with the Farmer Ranchman magazine writing articles, <coughs> Of course, this was back in the days of typewriters. I was very sloppy, and one of the nice people there said, well, there's a special paper you can get that you can erase on the typewriter. Well, that saved my job, and that was just one of the nice people there. That was an accommodation. And then when we got a new boss at the farm arrangement, he thought I was really weird and he was going to get rid of me. 
And then Jackie, the lovely lady that worked in the graphic design, is probably a little bit on the spectrum herself. She says, we've got to get a portfolio together. Jim's going to fire you. So I got every single article I did for Farm Ranchman and put it in this big scrapbook and showed it to him, and he gave me a raise. <laughs> you see, that again is selling the work. And yeah, you go to an employer, yeah, if fluorescent lights drive you crazy, yeah, you tell them about that. You know, tell them, just tell them they give you migraines or something, you know. Um, or you need a quiet place to work. You can't work if there's too many distractions. So if you want good work out of me, I can't have a cube right by the bathroom. That's just too much commotion going on there. Um, I always had to get things written down. So I'd be in a project meeting. The thing I learned is you get it written down exactly what the outcome of the job is. It had to be a certain budget, had to fit in a certain area, uh, had to uh, do certain things. And one thing that was very difficult for me to deal with was what I call the jealousy problem. I had two projects where, where high-level management employees broke some of my equipment because they were jealous. And I'm, one, I call it jealous engineer syndrome. The plant manager hires me, and the, the resident engineer at the plant doesn't like this nerd coming in on his turf. And I had a project where a corporate level person stuck a meat hook in a conveyor and broke it. And it was a type of meat hook that had no business being, being in that part of the plant. It's a stainless steel meat hook. Shouldn't be in the cattle department. And I, we had to guard a piece of equipment. So I learned if the plant engineer's sitting there like this in a project meeting, just like this and real silent, then I got a case of jealous engineer. Then I learned how to deal with that. You go find something that he made in the plant that's really nice and you praise him. Then another thing that you do is you give him a piece of the action. You let him design something on the project, make him feel important. And then jealous engineer's not gonna break your stuff. <laughs> and when this first happened, it was very difficult for me to get my head around somebody doing something so counterproductive on getting a project done. You know what, I'm cynical now. I chalk it up as normal bad human behavior. When my students get bummed out about this, I go, it's just normal bad human behavior. You know, let's just give them a piece of the action, you know, lick your shoes a little bit, and then it's gonna be happy. And do I like licking your shoes? No. But sometimes that's something that you gotta do in order to get the project done. I call that project loyalty. You do what you have to do to get the project done as long as it's not something illegal. You know, I, I'm not gonna do, uh, do something like that. Are these verbal guys, there are some things they can be extremely good at, specialty retail. I know a guy who got a PhD in history, and he's been employed all his life in specialty retail. You know, that can be things like men's suits, shoes, jewelry, electronics, lumberyard, toy store, video game place, something where this person really knows every single product. And uh, bookkeeping, anything to do with record keeping, they're really good with that. Uh, speech therapists, uh, legal researcher, I know a guy who's doing that. All he does all day is look stuff up on the internet for cases. Stage actor, accountants, library jobs, journalism jobs. I've been interviewed by journalists that I know are on the spectrum. <laughs> but we need to start learning, they've got to start learning how to do writing that other people want. So if they're doing the church newsletter, they can't talk about how much they hate some politician in there. That is just not appropriate. That's not, you know, you're writing for the church newsletter, you tell about what they did at the church picnic and maybe you think it's really boring, but that's something that you can put into your portfolio to get work later on. You know, save all of your work. You know, that's really an important thing. You know, and then you might get worried, well, some engineering company made you sign a confidentiality agreement. Well, that only applies as long as the stuff's not public. You know, and let's say you did some drawings. Well, you can show some little piece of a drawing, you don't even tell what it is. You know, my portfolio comes first. You know, economic survival. Now, I don't give away their trade secrets. In fact, there's a rocket company in the U.S. that just, uh, you know, successfully docked to the space station. He doesn't patent anything because he doesn't want to reveal how any of his stuff works. That's fine. So you can't give away, if you worked for them, how their stuff works. But you could draw some little part, little piece, 
When someone looks at that, they wouldn't even know it was part of a rocket. You'd just say it was a machined part. Because you got to show off your stuff. And in some of the meatpacking plants, I wasn't allowed to take pictures of jobs. I snuck them. <laughs> I snuck them, man. And one time I had a camera on the thing around my neck, and the, and the white coat barely covered it. And I got called into the plant manager's office. This guy's a total jerk. And, <laughs> and I, I would have been in trouble if I'd seen that camera. And I'd already taken pictures. But I only took pictures of my stuff. I didn't take pictures of everything. I took stuff as I designed. It was my equipment. I'm going to take a picture of my stuff. I don't really care what company policy is on that. I need that picture for selling jobs. You know, and you just, just that, that's, that's something that goes in my illegal but not bad category. <laughs> okay. So hopefully that's giving you some ideas on, on the whole job front. Now, bad jobs for people with autism, both on the high end and the low end of the spectrum, don't put a, a strain on working memory. Cashier in a busy restaurant with an old-fashioned cash register, forget it. Waitress in a busy restaurant, and she's got four plates up her arm, uh, there's no way, I'm going to drop them. It'd be a total disaster. And I can't remember long strings of verbal information. I've got to write it down. So let's say you're going into work and you might say to the boss, you know, I really like email. Email me the directions. Then you can print them out. You know, you can kind of like, I call it partial disclosure. I think sometimes going in somewhere and saying, well, I've got, you know, Asperger's, or I'm dyslexic, or I'm this, and now in the U.S. it's the ADA, Americans with Disabilities. And the ADA gives me this right and that right. Well, that's a way to get an employer's hackles up real fast. You need to show them what you do, and then you just say, well, I just need to sit down with you, and I need to just write down what I, what exactly what you want me to do. And then I'm going to remember it, and you're going to be happy, and I'll be happy. You know, disclose the particular accommodation that you need. Or sometimes you can just say, sometimes I just don't pick up subtle things. Don't be subtle with me. If you don't like something I do, just tell me. And there's a scene in the movie where my boss slams down the deodorant and says, you stink, use it. That actually happened. And I think that boss was a little bit on the spectrum. And he wasn't polite about it. <laughs> and he had his secretaries go out and buy, get me different clothes. Still kind of eccentric, but not just not, not a dirty slob. You know, I think sometimes I, you, know, you can tiptoe around these guys too much. I think it's OK to be eccentric, but you just can't be a slob. That's not all right. Now, how about people with poor verbal skills? What are some of the things they'd be good at? Well, there's lots of stuff in this country involving gardening. A lot more than what we have at home. All kinds of specialty landscaping things, even for some of the guys on the high end of the spectrum, real high-end gardening stuff. See, that would be another really good freelance business. Uh, factory assembly work, I know that's, probably won't be able to find that. Shelving books in the library. Uh, but this is why it's so important when kids are younger that they learn how to mow lawns for other people. You've got to learn that you're going to got to do work for other people outside the home. You know, and kids when they're young, they've got to do chores. You know, it's just um, we've got to like look for the employers too that would be sympathetic, because obviously when you're on the more severe end of the spectrum, the employer is going to know that the person's got a handicap. And as far as the teasing goes, what I've found is it's the mild Asperger kid gets tortured a lot more on the teasing in high school than the, than the individual that's much more severe, because they know he's severe, so they don't mess with him as much. OK, let's start looking at some medical stuff. And we have a real problem at home with uh, you know, high cost for drugs. When a new drug comes out, they're just selling it, selling it, selling it. And, and it may not even be that good a thing to use. Uh, we have all kinds of people out there selling all kinds of alternative treatments. And in anything, you've got to look at risk versus benefit. And one thing that's a big problem at home is somehow they got antipsychotic drugs approved for five-year-olds. I don't have enough bad language to describe what I'd like to do to the people that did that. Because there's just too many side effects like getting diabetes, getting tardive dyskinesia, Parkinsonian shaking problem that's, let's call it nerve damage. I like to call it what it really is, it's called nerve damage. 
and end up with osteoporosis when you get old because it messes up your bones, that's not a very good risk benefit. You know, I basically, I want to try some of the other things, like some of the special diets on little kids, because there's a subgroup where the special diets work. You know, you know three-month trial, doesn't work, then you ditch it. I, there is a place for medication. Careful, conservative use of medication. Medication saved me. I can't be against medication. And then evidence of effectiveness. Now, of course, I like, you know, refereed journal articles and good research. But the problem you got with autism is it's such an umbrella term that um, you got all these subgroups, and you can have a subgroup where one thing works, and another subgroup it doesn't work. See, us visual thinkers, we tend to be panic monsters that are, uh, get really anxious and have panic attacks and all of that, and that's where the antidepressants really work so well. So I have two ways I evaluate things, the scientific research, but then I have another thing I call the three family rule. I won't even mention the method publicly until I got three families that can convince me it worked after I go through legal deposition style questioning. Well, did you start a new school at the same time you started the diet? Did you start a drug at the same time you started the diet? Uh, did you have some kind of a family crisis at the same time you started it? You know, you've got you've to find out what is actually making the change. And I don't buy vague things like, well, he got better. I want, I want concrete information, like uh, he no longer has diarrhea. His stomach no longer hurts. He, uh, he went from four words to 300 words in three weeks. You know, I want, I want concrete data. He went from five or six temper tantrums a day to one a week. That's the sort of information I want to get out of people, really specific information. I've got that for special diets, and I've got that for Erlen lenses. And Erlen lenses, you can play around with that just messing around the sunglass store. That doesn't even cost you any money. It'd be pretty stupid to flunk out of school and fail because you didn't experiment with pastel papers and colored glasses. I know too many students where they've been saved, and they've been saved by glasses they just bought at the, um, you know, at the Walmart, which is our big discount store. Okay, these are the antidepressants. This class of drugs I'd like to rename the antiferents, anti-fear drugs because where these work, man, is stopping anxiety. They work better for that than they do for depression. And the three best ones are probably Prozac, Soloft, and Lexapro, and they're all generic in the U.S. now. I'm not, I'm pretty sure Prozac's generic over here now. I, as I mentioned in the last talk, low doses. If you give too high a dose, you can get agitation and insomnia. And unfortunately, there's a paper on the internet at, uh, suggesting monstrous doses of Prozac for people on the spectrum. Well, I went and I read the methods section, and I found out they'd kicked out half the subjects. If they had any heart problems, they were kicked out. And that'd be me. I've got a heart murmur. I'd be kicked out. Um, and anybody had even a hint of epilepsy was thrown out. I don't have epilepsy. So, you know, they threw out half the subjects. So maybe there's a subgroup that can have gigantic doses of Prozac. But there's also another subgroup that that's a disaster. I have had 100 parents say to me, he did wonderful on a low dose, and when we doubled it, it was absolutely awful. So if you start to see symptoms, not being able to sleep, and, and it's sort of like drinking 10,000 cups of coffee, you need to be reducing a dose. And my best books for that are Thinking in Pictures, the chapter called A Believer in Biochemistry, and my Way I See It book, The Way I See It book, you need to make sure you have the second edition. And those are all available on the Amazon website. Maybe I better use the changer so I stand in front of the video camera. Uh, now these drugs are what I call the heavy weapons. Uh, these are the atypical antipsychotics. And sometimes you need these. You have someone with very bad rage problems, especially somebody that's more severe on the spectrum little tiny dose of one of these, especially Risperidol, uh, uh, Abilify, or Seroquel, can stop rage. You know, and there have been some individuals where they will stay in their sheltered workshop or their group home taking a little bit of this. So there is a place sometimes to use heavy weapons. I just want to go back and mention that Paxil, which you call Seroquat over here, that's the worst drug on the shelf. But if you're taking it, don't change it. 
that's being pushed a lot in the states because it still has patents on it. See, drug companies at home push the drugs that have patents. You have less of that kind of nonsense over here. So be really careful with the heavy weapons. Unfortunately, at home, these are getting handed out like candy, and it's just terrible. Okay, now the low dose principle tends to apply to all the antidepressants, both the serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the tricyclics, um, and the atypical antipsychotics, all of the antidepressant medications. There's a subgroup that if you give them too high a dose, it's going to be a mess. And some doctors have a hard time believing that such a little dose will work. But oftentimes, they only need a starter dose or maybe half a starter dose, little doses. The thing about medication is when they work, they can really work well. And I don't think I'd be here right now if I hadn't gone on antidepressants. I've been on them now 35 years. Can I ever get off them? There's no research to guide me. Nobody does research on, on maybe taking old ladies and weaning them off of this stuff. And I don't particularly want to be the experiment, so <laughs> I'm going to just keep taking it. Okay, here are some principles of using medication and supplements. Try one thing at a time so you can figure out what's working. And when it, if you're using medication for a behavior problem, don't do try three meds at once. Okay, let's say they give you three prescriptions. Ask, well, which one should you try first? Because you've got to find out what's actually working. And the thing I want to try to get you to do is be very logical about what you're doing. You know, there's a bad problem with every time that you have a crisis, people are just throwing drugs at it. You know, upping doses, throwing more prescriptions at it. And that's just atrocious. If you have a, uh, the other thing is, when you're using a medication for things like anxiety or behavior problems, it should have some wow factor. Like, wow, this stuff really works. You don't give out powerful drugs like Risperidol just to make a child a little bit less fidgety or to make them sleep better. Uh-uh, you don't use powerful drugs like Risperidol for that purpose. And then if you have a child that's on a cocktail of stuff and you've got to get some, rid of some of it, you take them off one at a time slowly. I've talked to good doctors at home that tell me all they do is take kids off of all the rubbish they're on. And be careful switching brands generic. They're not bioequivalent. There's differences in how the pills are pressed, which affects how they dissolve. And this is true for every medication that you're taking. So you go to the pharmacy and you find you got white pills instead of blue ones. First thing you better check is to make sure they mix up the prescription. And then if it's just a different vendor, then you got to watch and see if it works right. And the dose might have to be adjusted. There's about 20% difference in how the drugs work. I have found that with all the medications I've had. I've had to switch over to the generic on my tricyclic antidepressant because the company doesn't make it, it make the brand name anymore. And I had to take diuretics when I got Meniere's disease, and I found that they were slightly different. I found that just about with every medication I've taken. You know, so if, you've, if you're buying one pharmacy's brand of it, stick with it. Don't be switching around and getting pills from different vendors. That's just not good. And if you're stuck in a situation where that happens and you can't control it, just be on the watch out that does it work really right. And don't expect any medication to give you 100% control of symptoms because it won't. I still had some anxiety problems. My anxiety kind of went in cycles. It would kind of cycle up and down. And before I took the medication, it was going like the German Autobahn, between the German Autobahn and the highest speed on your motorway, sort of like that. That's before I took the drug. And after I took the drug, it was sort of moving, cycling, but, but at a lower level. It stopped the constant fear. My fear center is three times bigger than normal. And it damped down that kind of overreactivity. Now, some other medications that are really useful are the blood pressure medications. And our army right now is rediscovering these drugs for treating post-traumatic stress syndrome. And one of the oldies but goodies is the beta blocker propanolol. Sometimes where this one really works, you got a nonverbal client, real hot and sweaty, and they're real hot and sweaty, and a little bit of propanolol can really calm them down. I know visual thinkers that take a little Prozac in the morning, like a half dose of Prozac, 
and they throw down one of these beta blockers at night, oh, they're wonderful. The other thing that's nice about beta blockers is you can pop them just when you need them, and they're not addictive, they're not a controlled substance. You notice I don't have any of the benzos up here, you know, like Valium and oh, all that garbage. I don't have that, I won't touch that stuff. I think you're better off controlling anxiety with, with things like antidepressants and things like blood pressure pills because you don't have the problem of the addiction problem and, all, and having to get escalating doses and then getting impossible to get off the stuff. Clonidine, so that's another blood pressure pill, is sometimes a really good sleep aid. A lot of people use that just for, you know, for sleeping. You can use melatonin. These are dirt cheap old drugs. You know what? There's no new drugs in the pipeline right now that are worth even trying. Oh, I get the American Journal of Psychiatry, I just want to throw up when I see the drug ads. And they've got new antidepressants. And I read all the fine print, and the only thing they can, only thing they can say about, brag about this drug is that it's new. It doesn't have any other advantage. You know, it's new and expensive, why would you even want to use it? Now, another class of drugs are the, are the epilepsy drugs, the anticonvulsants. Most of these have been around for a long, long time. And where these work really well, and I'm not talking about tantrums in two-year-olds, I'm talking about, let's say, somebody partially verbal, and you get rage attacks out of the blue. Like he might be listening to his music player, next thing you know he's slamming it against the wall and kicking a wall in. That's actually psychomotor epilepsy, where it just comes on like a switch. And that's where you can lots of times control that with one of these epilepsy drugs. You know, Depico, uh, uh, Vomitco, Tocmemax, I've got, also got the uh, generic name there. Some of these might have different names over here. Um, now the bad thing about the epilepsy drugs is you gotta do blood samples out of here to make sure they don't wreck your liver. Well, you don't have to do that with the other drugs. And if you do your blood samples, then you know, if it is causing a problem, they can stop it before it causes a problem. There is a genetic test that's been developed where they can do one blood test and tell you whether it's safe to take these, but I don't think that's out in the clinics yet. Okay, ADHD drugs, the stimulants. You know, Asperger's and, and ADHD get mixed up all the time diagnostically, and there's actually crossover genetically between, um, between Asperger's and ADHD. And the genetics in autism, talk about complicated. It is complicated. And stimulants sometimes make an, a, a mild Asperger better, but a, but a person that's more classically autistic, it tends to make them worse. You'll know. One pill, you'll know. You will know. Sometimes those work. You gotta look up all your interactions. That applies to everything that you're taking. You know, we got a lot of old people at home that are just taking too much stuff. And, and, and stuff interacts, like for example, a lot of allergy medicines and a lot of uh, medicines for colds make antidepressants not work. Then you can get really bad interactions, like St. John's wort can make antibiotics not work, make um, anti-rejection drugs not work. I mean, real critical stuff here. It's okay to use St. John's wort, but you better be careful what you're mixing it with. Um, if you have to go on antibiotics, I'd recommend don't take any herbal supplements for 10 days. Just go off them for 10 days because the interactions are not all on the internet. I spent two hours trying to look up interactions because I was taking some herbal things for yeast and I got sick and I went on antibiotics and there was supposedly no interactions. Two days into my antibiotics, they weren't working. So I stopped the herbal stuff, the antibiotics kicked in and worked. But a lot of herbal things can clear really vital drugs like antibiotics out of your system. And basically, you don't want to take any more junk than what you absolutely need to take. You know, you want to take the few things that really work. And the problem that we have at home is everybody's going around all these specialists, and now you're going to five specialists and they prescribe a drug to fix their part of the body, but it actually messes up some other part of the body, and you need to sit down with one general kind of doctor and figure out what stuff you actually need to be taking. You know, my Meniere's disease now has gone into remission, and, and I find I don't need to take the diuretics anymore. I still have them, but I don't take them anymore. You know, it's, it's stopped. I don't need to take that. Okay, special diets, they work for some people. Some of the vitamin supplements I think are worth trying, B vitamins. There's problems in autism with B metabolism being all messed up. 
Exercise. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of vigorous exercise. I do a hundred sit-ups every night, and I hate every single one of those sit-ups. <laughs> and I just want to mention one thing for, um, you know, I talked about the Meniere's disease. I have tinnitus, you know, ringing in the ears. I'll tell you a way to not go crazy from that. And the brain can't listen to three things at once. So if you put on, when you're sleeping, you put on a wave machine, and then a radio maybe playing some classical music, and you put those on really soft, you can tune out the tinnitus. You know, you can't have any words, no, you don't want vocal music, you can't have any news or anything going on. Now I could uh, listen to Spanish station, that would work because I didn't understand it. But you had to have like two totally different things going. Some individuals find a weighted blanket is calming. Now one of the so-called biomedical things that seems to really be helpful is omega-3 supplements, the fish oil supplements. They're getting good science now for being good for the brain. Now, back home, we've got a real problem with being on an omega-3 deficient diet. Maybe, you, maybe it's not so much a problem here, but boy, it's a problem at home. And, and uh, it helps grow the myelin sheaths that insulate your nerves. Poor diet, tons of sugar and carbs and things like that tend to have more depression. The thing that happens, you know, there's a lot of things out there that people are selling, a lot of exotic treatments, and uh, most of that stuff hasn't um, satisfied my three-family rule, but things like some of the vitamins, it's got some science, uh, some of the special diets work for some people, especially if you've got celiac in the family, and the omega-3 supplements. That stuff is definitely worth trying. Now, let's just look at my family history. On uh, my father's side, we've got some Asperger's and uh, bankers. They were the word kind of thinkers. My grandfather on my mother's side, the engineer who co-invented the automatic pilot for airplanes. Anxiety and depression, both sides of the family. See, there's a lot of crossover with a lot of these different things. Visual thinking on the mother's side of the family. Mother's a visual thinker. My sister's an interior decorator. You know, very, very, very visual. Food allergies on my father's side. Intellectual giftedness, and I think in autism, is linked. You get a little bit of the trait, you get intellectual giftedness. You get too much of the trait, and then you've got problems. And it's lots of little tiny code changes in lots and lots of different genes. It's not a simple genetics. And there may also be interactions with environment, things like older parents may increase autism. Right now in the US there's a big controversy about the increase in autism diagnosis. And a big portion of that is other disabilities getting put into autism because they can get funding for it. Changes in the diagnostic criteria. And as I said this morning, one of the reasons for changing Asperger's to social communication disorders and funding, I know has a lot to do with that. Okay, what would happen to Albert in your local school system today? No speech until age three, really weird and quirky. What would happen to him? Well, back home, I'd be worried about him being put on too many drugs. Maybe you're not doing so much of that today, and young kids here, hopefully not. Uh, but what would happen to little Albert? You know, he had to have the opportunities to get exposed to new ideas. You know, he worked as a patent clerk, and he was really weird. He wore green bedroom slippers to work that had pink flowers on them when he was a patent clerk. But the thing about being a patent clerk is you get exposed to a lot of different new ideas. It was probably the perfect job for him. That's when he came up with the theory of relativity in the patent office. You know, let's say he'd had a little different tract. Then maybe he wouldn't become a great physicist. You know, it um, makes you really, really think. And in Different Not Less, uh, one of the uh, people in, in the book, and in the book consists of 14 um, different people writing their own stories in their own words, I was the editor of it, that all have jobs, they got diagnosed later in age because of relationship problems. And one lady works for Intel in computers. And she, her, when her dad died, she really got upset about that and it was messing her up at work. And that's why she got diagnosed. And her boss asked her the million dollar question. If you had known that you had Asperger's younger, would you have achieved a high level job at Intel, you know, computer, you know, computer chip company. That's the million dollar question. You know, and the thing you're gonna find in reading that book is none of those people had an easy road. They had to work hard. 
I agreed with the statement that was put up here earlier that said 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. I think originally that came from uh, Thomas Edison. Um, it's hard work. Those people worked hard. They had paper routes as kids. They were taught how to work when they were really young. And I think that really helped them out. As Stephen Shore is in that book, and when he was in college, he had a bicycle repair shop in his dorm room. Now that's being really resourceful. And that helped pay for, his, for going through college. And this is a book about famous scientists and musicians that probably were on the spectrum. Be a great book to get for students that are getting teased and bullied in high school. You know, they've got some really good company. 